this was some great information this morning and I think you've seen some of the trends as we move through this really to help you understand how to navigate this thing we call uh, Christian education, this work that we do. And um, I want to tell you a little story as we close out. We'll be finished here in just a moment. But it's a story of a 17-year-old man. It's for, he's really from, or 17-year-old young man from a uh, rural town in Florida. Uh, matter of fact, it was a little town called Frostproof. Small church, one staff member. He was loved by his parents. Lay leaders invested in him as a child. Um, uh, as a teenager, the church called their first full-time slash pass slash staff member you know and i thought they used to call me the axe man when i was administrator but not never the slasher so uh, uh because we had to redo some of our staff and that was kind of an embarrassing title to have but nonetheless that was what they kidded me about being but uh this was the slash music and youth minister anyone ever grow up in those days yeah okay so the, those don't exist much anymore today um, but a music youth minister, and it was through these experiences that God placed within the heart of this young man a love for the church and his people. And, uh, his, and let me just say something about his calling. It couldn't really be described as one of those knee-bending, uh, awe-inspiring moments in time when God spoke, the young man fell on his face and on his knees, and when, without a doubt knew that God was calling and speaking. It was more like the, this young man was moving on a path that could only lead to one destination. Uh, that was where God would make it, and that destination was where God made it very clear that, that he was calling this young man uh, into full-time vocational ministry. Now here's the interesting thing, remember he was 17, that imperfect, adolescent, immature, 17 year old, that person was me, and my, if my wife were here in this session, which I don't know if she is or not, she met me two years later and I was still immature adolescent imperfect so <laughs> and i'd already been serving on church staffs at that point at 19. Um, but in the beginning serving as a minister of education you need to know this wasn't even on my radar i didn't even know there was such a person i'd never seen one never even knew they existed uh, because i had a very limited church perspective in that sense um, uh, obviously though over the years god has and, and will, I think, continue to do the things in my life uh, that really helped reshape this calling, helped me understand what it meant to be called, but not only called into vocational ministry, but called into this area of work. We call Christian education or discipleship, whatever we may call it today, but this area of equipping the church to make disciples. And uh, I want to leave you with some thoughts related to the calling then as we leave this time. You've heard a lot about it already, so I just want to recap a little bit and add a little bit extra to that as well. I don't want to attempt to outline biblical basis of a calling today. There's not enough time to do that, and there's a lot of varied opinions on, on what that means as well, so we're not going to really debate that. Uh, but I want to just give you some things out of my experience and some, of, uh, some things that I believe God has taught me over the years through the scriptures related to this, what, what we call a vocational calling, this special calling to certain individuals. Uh, for certain assignments. We know that we see that in scripture. You have Moses, we have uh, Joshua, we have the prophets, we have John the Baptist, Peter, and Paul, and many others where they were set aside for a specific reason, for a specific calling. And uh, in Ephesians 4.11, we love those passages, but you know it starts off with the phrase, and he, and he personally gave some. Well, right there, let you know that there is a specific call. He didn't say he gave everyone. He personally gave some. So it's not just a general call to, to all believers. There is the sum, those that he's done this for, or he's initiated a calling to. They were chosen for a special assignment. And he gave some, he personally gave some to be. There was a specific assignment, and you know the rest of that passage. So knowing you're called, here's some thoughts, and I want to leave with you about calling. Knowing you're called to vocational ministry, I believe, is absolutely necessary. I think you need to know that, or you will have difficulty, as Randy outlined some of the things we experience, as staff people especially, 
you will have difficulty enduring till the, to the end if you don't go back and understand your calling. And uh, you'll face circumstances that challenge you, possibly cause you to uh, c consider quitting. Uh, Bill Gambrell's testimony last night, wasn't that great? And uh, the fact that he was very honest with us about some of the things he'd been through and the struggles that it brought about in his life. And if we were all to be honest, we've had those struggles ourselves. There's been two times when I wanted to, uh, to, to walk away. One was when Becky, my wife's dad, passed away back in the early 90s. And he was a farmer. And at that time, we had um, just transitioned to a church, but it was one of those churches where you were having to deal with a lot of uh, uh, landmines. And you know, you just kind of did, I really want to deal with people. <laughs> Uh, her dad had cows, and I said, you know, if a cow talks back, you just eat him. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so it made farming look really, really appealing at the time. Uh, didn't have to have much trouble with the cows. You just take care of them. But you couldn't do that on church staff. But you know, I couldn't walk away from calling. Couldn't. Absolutely not. Uh, there was another time when I exper experienced some turmoil. It was one of the most difficult journeys in terms of a position that I was in that I've ever had. And there were times when, when I, I just, what did I do? You know, why am I here? But through those times, looking back, I believe God was at work, no doubt about it. Now it's something I don't wanna ever go through again, but it was, I do believe God was at work in those areas. And here's what it did. It drove me to my knees. It drove me to my knees before God. I ask a lot of questions, including the why question. I think our Father doesn't mind us asking why. He wants to help us understand why. And God spoke. He affirmed my calling. He prepared me for the next phase of ministry every time. I'm confident that if you're called, yes, you will have difficult times. But when you go to your knees and you seek the Lord, He will help you work through that. So I challenge you to do that. You've got to know you're called. There, another reason is you're gonna face times when God redirects your calling in a cer certain direction. Uh, for me, I, my only frame of reference was music and youth ministry. So I didn't feel like I was called to be a pastor, so what else would I do? Music and youth. And I went to school, prepared for that type of position. Um, and then out of that, through a series of events, which time prohibits telling my whole story, but God moved me from that, moved to seminary at Southwestern, completely changed my perspective on what ministry was about. I learned how to do Christian education ministry at Southwestern in the 80s. And it, from that experience, God transformed my life. And I actually discovered there were these guys called ministers of education. I didn't even, even at that point did not know. And the Lord used that to reshape and refocus my ministry and help me understand what this work of Christian education was really all about. Out of that, I transitioned uh, to a student ministry because I still had a passion at that time and was able to still do a lock-in because you know that was really big back then. Uh, thank goodness they've gotten past those most places. Uh, but, uh, but I was in student ministry. I thought, okay, this is it, I've locked in. But you know, I had a wise pastor. Six months after coming to be his student minister, a, man, a pastor named Argel Smith. Some of you know him. Uh, Dr. Argel Smith, he was here on seminary at seminary for, for a season. And uh, he, he and I, our families gathered for a uh, Labor Day dinner, uh, lunch one, uh, six months after I had arrived. And he said, John, have you ever considered being a minister of education? And no, I hadn't. I thought student ministry was where, where I was going to land. It was gonna be student, the education side of student ministry. And uh, he said, well, I wanna give you a chance to work those skills because I see something in you that, that uh, isn't being fulfilled. And I don't think it will ever be fulfilled until you invest in this way in ministry. And he gave me a chance to do that. And that led to my transition to education ministry in 1991. From that, on, that time on, that has been my focus and my passion. And the Lord has used those times, but you will face times when God redirects your calling. That doesn't mean you're no longer called. It just means he's given you a new assignment within that calling. And there were times when I felt guilty leaving student ministry. But looking back now, I know that was all in God's plan. I was called to ministry first. 
and then God reshaped that along the way. Uh, you and your family will be required um, to sacrifice more than the normal church member usually does. And sacrifice isn't always a bad thing. It's not always a good thing. Um, so, so you need to understand that. But you know this. Sometime you're in a fishbowl. And you don't get to leave on Sundays two out of four Sundays every year, as Matt Curry talked uh, two out of four Sundays every month, as Matt Curry mentioned yesterday. You're not there all the time. You have to be there. And not only that, you should really want to be there. But, uh, but you do not have the same privileges as members. You are uh, to set an example. So you live at a different level than your members do. And my, might I add too, that even includes the way you, you raise your family, the way you, uh, the decisions you make as a minister, the decisions, uh, the things you do as a minister, you are, you are to be, you are at a different level because you are setting the example. You are setting the standard, but you've got to make sure you're called. Because I think if you don't feel you're called, you may not be willing to make that sacrifice. So I want to challenge you to consider that. And then you may be asked to go where you never thought you would go. My goodness, uh, Paul. Here was Paul. You think about the Apostle Paul. Acts 2, 22, 21 says this. He said to me, go because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Why did God send a, a Jew of Jews, a person who was educated in Jewish theology, a person who had great ties to religious leaders, who could have had a great deal of influence in the Jewish culture, his home culture, why did he send him to the Gentiles? But you know, sometimes we ought to understand that God's ways aren't our ways, and your calling may take you away from your home. Your calling may take you away from your family. Uh, I moved, Becky and I moved from South Florida to Fort Worth, Texas, away from both sets of our parents and our brothers and sisters. And we had no idea what that journey would, would entail. Uh, at the time, we just thought that was what we we're supposed to be doing. That's where God led us. And we left. And it was difficult back then. You didn't have the cheaper flights like you do today, and you don't have the cell phones. And you know, my parents said, call, collect when you get there, and then hang up just so we'll know you're there. You know, some of you guys can't even relate to that. But, uh, and my daddy, when I left, uh, he, and, and he said, son, he had an account for his uh, uh, business that he had. And he said, son, I'm gonna write it. I'm gonna give you a blank check and I'm gonna sign it. And if you ever need it, just fill in the amount and then call me and tell me what it is. And we left, moved to Fort Worth, Texas. From there to Midland, Texas. You think we'd get closer to home, but no, we went on out a little further. Then we started coming back a little closer, Shreveport, then Panama City, Mobile, now Nashville. But you know what? We've never been back home. And there are times when I miss that. But then I see some guys who say they're called who are unwilling to even consider or entertain a motion of that kind of move. And I think we limit God. But when you're called, you can't just say no to God. <coughs> You have to move forward. Uh, here are some things that uh, a couple of writers of books have said. Jeff York, um, I guess that's the way, I, the president of Gateway Seminary, in his book, is, is, is God Calling Me, says this. He says, we serve in response to God's invitation and at his pleasure, not our initiative. He goes on to say, it's a calling we answer, not a, a career we pursue. He says, a call is a profound impression from God. It is a work of the heart. And one other thing, he says, a call establishes perimeters for our life. And we cannot go beyond those perimeters. We have to know we're called. Jimmy Draper in his book, Don't Quit Before You Finish, says this, the lack of uncertainty of a divine call to the ministry is one of the main reasons why almost half of seminary students leave the ministry within five years after leaving seminary. Almost half. Make sure you're called. You need that assurance. You need to know. Define your call. Uh, defining your call is also indispensable. Um, let me just say this real quickly. Being hired or voted on does not define your call. It's not the way you're, you transition to a church job. Uh, how you're viewed by others does not define your calling. 
Uh, this is kind of humbling, actually. At last, um, over the last six months, I've had three people come to me and say things like, you work here during the week? Anyone ever said that to you? I didn't know you worked here during the week. What do you do on Monday through Friday? You know, I, oh, is this your job? You know, uh, but people's view of you does not define your calling. Now, let make sure they have a good view of you, okay? But their view of, of, of what you do in your work does not define your calling. The level of position or the title does not define your call. Just because you don't preach or just because you're not called pastor or because you are called pastor, doesn't, if you have that in your title, doesn't mean you're called. Paul to the Roman church said this about himself. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. If you are called, you're called by God and that's it. Now it better be affirmed by the way you live your life. If it's not lining up, then there is something wrong and you need to check that. But uh, don't let people define your calling. God defines your calling. Living out your calling is indispensable. I'll leave you with these notes from a, a Junior Hill. This was a list that Jimmy Draper compiled of things that Junior Hill, who's an evangelist, said about being called into the ministry. Just some, this is some advice as we leave here today. Don't neglect your personal relationship with the Lord. We know that but it doesn't hurt to be reminded. Don't fail your wife and family. Love the church, God does. Oh, and by the way, let me say that. I have heard people who say, who talk about the church, who are called, who have a bitterness toward the church. And I think, how on earth can you serve a church you don't love? So love the church, God does. Always be an encourager. Never make a decision when you're discouraged or depressed. This probably means never make a decision on Monday. Okay, <laughs> for some. Doubt never means yes. Don't let anger be a pattern for your behavior. Let your teaching, your leading, your preaching, your, your speaking be from the Bible and the outflow of your heart with God and your passion for investing in your leaders. It should be from the overflow. That means you're growing in the Lord. There is no excuse for being unprepared. Don't flirt with temptations, money, or anything else, or anyone else. How many times have we seen people fall because of that? Or lose their perspective because money became an issue and money became their God. Be an example of integrity. You're a steward of your position, your influence, and your legacy. Don't be surprised by opposition. You can't please everyone. And be quick to forgive mistakes and admit your own. Pretty good advice. Pretty good advice. Now, as a 17-year-old, I had no idea what this calling would involve. I have a little bit more of an idea now. Uh, but the journey, I will have to say, was well worth it and is well worth it. I, out of this journey, I've been with some amazing churches, been influenced by some amazing leaders, got to uh, be a part of some amazing things. But you know what? I got to sit, watch the relationship with my wife grow. By the way, as a teenager, she, was, she surrendered to a call, and that was to call to be a minister's wife. She had no idea what she was getting into. Uh, but uh, and, and so but she surrendered to that that kind of ministry as a teenager and I've got to watch our our two young men our two boys grow up to be godly young men with godly wives serving in a in a great church and we're watching our grandchildren grow up now and uh, just watching that all unfold has been amazing and it's all been along with the journey we've called uh, this calling we've had to ministry Here's the most important thing though. I got to join God in his work. And I got to come to know him in ways really that are indispensable. Not only invaluable, but indispensable. And uh, that's the most important thing is how I've come to know God through this journey we call calling. 
And so I pray that at the end of the day, you will say that this calling, this journey for you has been not only absolutely necessary, can't walk away from it, but also invaluable in the fact that you have learned so much more about the Lord than you ever dreamed you could have otherwise. So I hope you'll take those thoughts with you as we leave today. Don't forget, uh, next year, 2016, I want to pray for us as we leave today. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this conference. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time together. I thank you, Lord, for these leaders that we've heard through throughout these last days, the wisdom, the experiences, the knowledge, the uh, guidance that has been given, Father, the tools that we've uh, received. I thank you for the release relationships that have been built during this week that will prayerfully continue on. And Father, I just pray that we'll leave this place going back, knowing that the work we are doing is certainly indispensable. So Father, may we act responsibly with that work and take what we've learned and begin to allow it to shape the ministry you've given us, this calling that you've placed us in, so that we can serve you with, in a way, Father, that will uh, reflect the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the work of the Holy Spirit in our churches, that we will see lives transformed. And Father, thank you for letting us be a part of your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.